Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're getting to the close of the season of Epiphany. Again, we have been seeing Jesus' glory revealed to us in the scriptures uh, throughout this season. And today, uh, we are continuing to see Jesus' glory as he teaches us what real love is. Uh, today, Jesus calls us to be his followers uh, by showing an otherworldly kind of love. We are to love our enemies. This is something that we naturally can never accept. It strikes us as absolute insanity, but it is good. It is godly. It is wise. Today, we want to spend some time meditating on these fascinating words from our Savior uh, and what those words mean for us. We will begin uh, by reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. There it says, uh, there Jesus says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is God's word. These words are uh, a continuation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, or sermon uh, which we uh, have started looked at started looking at last week uh, it's similar to Jesus sermon on the mount from Matthew chapter 5 and going on from there uh, this is in Luke chapter 6 where it's Jesus sermon on the plain and he's touching on a lot of the same issues last week as we began this sermon Jesus talked about the blessed state of those who are suffering and struggling in life but the cursed state of those who are doing well there, Jesus began speaking about the incredible change in perspective that Christianity brings us uh, because uh, it teaches us to realize that all of us are going to die one day. And at that point, all earthly blessings will become completely useless. <laughs> but Christianity offers us resurrection when Jesus comes again at the end of time when we will receive eternal blessings. So this changes our perspective regarding what is truly important in life right now. And that change in perspective is also going to bring with it a change in our behaviors, especially how we treat other people. This is what Jesus is, is going to be explaining throughout this section. Uh, Jesus begins with a really interesting statement. He says, but I tell you who hear me. And Jesus is talking to the people who are actually listening to him here. Just like people uh, who heard Jesus first speak those words about 2,000 years ago, many of us today are going to simply ignore what Jesus teaches here. Many will uh, happily listen, uh, but at the same time, we're going to be thinking about other things, right? Uh, what Jesus says is not going to stick anywhere, right? Many of us are, are going to just dismiss what Jesus says uh, and outright reject it. May we hear what Jesus says today because he has some difficult, serious, and tremendously important words for us. Today, Jesus discusses real love. We are to love our enemies. And Jesus gives us some help uh, for us to understand him here. He defines what he means by love. He says, do good to those who hate you. Now, that is really helpful because uh, our culture right now is really struggling to understand what love even is, right? Many people uh, see love as an emotion. And so we think, how am I supposed to feel love for my enemies? 
others think that love means embracing and celebrating all the life choices that someone else makes. And so here we hear Jesus say this and we think, well, how on earth can I celebrate the life choices of someone who chooses to hurt me, right? But Jesus points, us, uh, points out that love means doing good to others. In 1 John chapter 3, uh, we read these words, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Christianity consistently teaches that love is an action. Christians, uh, lo Christian love is not something you feel. Uh, it's not an opinion you have, but it instead, it instead is something that you do. No one can look into your heart and see if you love someone. They can't read your mind to tell if you love somebody, but they can look at your actions and see evidence of your love, right? And this is the kind of love that our God shows to us. I highly doubt that Jesus felt warm fuzzies uh, about you and me as he was hanging on the cross, but regardless of how he might have felt about us in that moment, his actions are clear evidence of his love for you and me. Right? This is the kind of love that we are to show. This is one of the reasons why we say God is love instead of love is God. Because God defines love for us. He helps us to better understand what love means, both in the way he shows his love to us and also how he then teaches us to love himself and to love one another. This is a, one of the great values of studying the Ten Commandments and the rest of Christian morality because it teaches us what it actually looks like to love God and to love others. Even uh, most non-Christian people uh, will agree that people ought to love one another, but they're going to vastly di di uh, disagree on what exactly love means. For us as Christians, Jesus is the one who defines love for us. And this better understanding of love then, uh, with that better understanding of love. Jesus now calls us to show that same kind of love to our enemies. And wow, <laughs> uh, this is truly a timely message, right? Uh, our culture is becoming more and more divisive all the time. We hear all kinds of us versus them narratives all over the place. Uh, we truly do have a lot of enemies, both within and without, people who want to destroy our country, people who want to destroy our way of life, our churches, our faith, uh, everything that we care about. But what are we to do with those enemies? Jesus says, love them. Do good to them. As I already said, uh, our flesh thinks this is insanity, right? Uh, if we do good to the, our enemies, aren't they just going to destroy us all the more quickly, right? <laughs> uh, but the reality is uh, that there actually is great wisdom, even for this life, in what Jesus demands of us here. For example, think about the political movements of people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., in movements like those, people chose to peacefully respond even when uh, their enemies were violent and their cause uh, was all the stronger for it. Had they responded with violence instead of peace, uh, their enemies would have escalated their violence and destroyed them. But this is not only the case in politics. You also look at Christian history. How did Christianity spread throughout the world? Throughout history, Christianity has been one of the most persecuted religions, if it is not uh, actually the most uh, persecuted. I don't have the numbers, so I can't say for sure. But it's, it's consistently faced a ton of persecution, and it's still being persecuted brutally even to this day. And yet, as Christians are attacked, tortured, and killed, as they put this love for their enemies into practice... Christianity has grown throughout the millennia to become the most widespread world religion. Loving our enemies did not destroy Christianity. Instead, God used this very teaching to grow this religion so that it spread throughout the world. And so today, we want to really think about what it means to love our enemies. Jesus gives us a few examples. Uh, if someone curses you, we are to bless them. If someone mistreats you, you are to pray for them. By the way, praying for your enemies is a great place to start in our efforts to put Jesus' words into practice. Uh, and the more you do that, the more you spend that time uh, outside of that situation where that person is harming you, right, uh, that you can pray for them, uh, you're going to teach yourself uh, to actually put that love into practice when you are in the moment. Uh, Jesus it gives another example. He says, if someone slaps you on the cheek, right, you are to turn to them the other also. He says, if someone takes your coat, uh, you're not to stop them from taking your shirt also. Now, 
These are certainly difficult situations, but I do want us all to be thinking through how do we put Jesus' words into practice, right? Uh, we, we cannot just sit here and say, well, okay, yeah, I'm bad at loving, but Jesus loved me, amen, let's move on. No, God wants us to live this way. And now, if you can't think of any enemies in your personal life, uh, consider yourself blessed. Uh, many of us can think of plenty of enemies in our lives. Uh, and so we need to be wrestling with Jesus' words here. How do you love your brother-in-law, for example, who cheated on your sister? How do you love that teenager who bullied your daughter? Again, these are difficult questions, but they need to be wrestled with for us as Christians. How do we actually do what Jesus calls us to do? Once again, the Christian church has been putting these words into practice for thousands of years, and they provide many excellent examples for us uh, to really think through, yeah, what does it mean to love our enemies? Not long ago, there was a video uh, making the rounds are going around the internet uh, of a mother who was speaking to her daughter's murderer, uh, but that woman was a Christian. And she said to this stone-faced murderer, she said, even though she would never speak to her daughter again, she still chose to forgive this man. Uh, I recently heard about a, a, a documentary uh, about school shootings, uh, which in this documentary, they found that Christian schools that got shot up, um, they were much more likely to forgive than, did, uh, or than were other uh, schools of other religions, other faiths. Jesus said that one of the ways that the world would know that we are his disciples is that is by how we love one another. Loving our enemies is one of the ways that Christianity is unique in this world. Then Jesus gave us the his beautiful golden rule. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, this, there's just a wealth of wisdom here. Um, it, it's valuable for us to think about it in, in all different kinds of aspects of life, right? Uh, how do you like other people to talk uh, to you? How do you like other people to talk about you? right? Uh, how do you like other people to think about you? Uh, how would you like other people to judge you? How would you like other people uh, to treat you at the store or on the highway or online, right? Well, Jesus says that you are to do the same for other people. Next, Jesus pierces through our moral arrogance. Uh, many of us would say we are loving people, uh, but the evidence that we would give is that we love our families or our friends or those who are close to us. And Jesus points out that that really doesn't mean anything. He says, even the most wicked people do that same thing, right? Even the most vile fiend will do good to others if they believe they will get uh, good in return for it, right? Even the most greedy people will lend to others if they believe that they're going to get something back for lending, right? <laughs> Loving those who love you is what selfish people do, Jesus tells us. There is no reason to brag about loving the people who are going to show you love back. Uh, that doesn't make you loving. It does not make you good. But... If you love those people who will not return that love, if you give to those people who will not pay you back, now you actually are being loving. Now you actually are being generous. Jesus says, then you will be children of the Most High. That is what God does, isn't it? He grants blessing to those who never thank him. He gives good things to horribly wicked people. And let's make sure that we're not excluding ourselves in what Jesus is saying here, right? How many blessings from God do we receive without thanking him at all? How often uh, does God continue to bless us even though our moral track record would absolutely declare that we do not deserve anything good from God? How much more uh, then does it apply to our salvation, right? Jesus died and rose again for our eternal salvation and yet how ungrateful we often are for those great eternal blessings. Despite the, the hope of eternal life, how often do we choose to live in our sins? rather than live in glorifying God. But despite our sin, God continues to grant us his rich blessings. He does not cast us aside. He does not abandon us. He does not get back at us or give us what we deserve. Instead, he continues to forgive us. He continues to promise us eternal life. He continues to remind us of our baptisms. He continues to give himself to us in Holy Communion. As we said before, the reason that we do not want to love our enemies is because we think we will suffer for it. We believe that, uh, that we will miss out on blessings if we live the way Jesus says. But Jesus dismisses that thought outright. He says that not judging and not condemning others will point us to how our God will not judge and will not condemn us when judgment day comes. As we forgive others, so our God will uh, forgive us on the last day. 
Whatever we lose in this life, as we uh, give to others, Jesus will grant us much more in the life to come. So much that, so that the, the loss here now and now uh, won't even be comparable to how much blessing we are going to receive from our God. Do not be afraid to follow Jesus' will for your life. It is good, it is godly, and it is wise. Loving your enemies will bring you and others great blessing, but more importantly, this is how we rise above normal sinful human interaction to be like Jesus. Luther once pointed out that we are Christ's, both with and without the apostrophe. We belong to Jesus, we are Christ's, right? With, with, the, apost yeah, with the apostrophe, uh, Jesus paid for us by his blood to buy us back from sin, death, hell, and Satan. Uh, this sermon uh, likely pointed out uh, that uh, you're nowhere near as loving as maybe you like to think you are. Uh, maybe you even felt some guilt listening just now. But Jesus has bought you back from that guilt. He has removed that guilt by his death on the cross and by his life of perfect love. He has granted you that perfect moral status. You no longer belong to sin and shame. Instead, you belong to Jesus and you are his forever but we are also Christ's without the apostrophe. In fact, the word Christian means a little Christ. To be a Christian is to be a little Jesus. We are to be Jesus to the world around us. And so, just as Jesus conquered sin, death, and hell, not by violently lashing out against it, but instead by turning the other cheek, so you and I aim to conquer evil in the world around us, not by attacking it head on, but instead by showing love just as Jesus did. We are Christ's. Amen. And I say, I say, I say, can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy with me.